Allora, buonasera a tutti quanti, uh, io mi chiamo Davide Corona, sono un uh, ricercatore dell'Istituto Teleton Dulbecco, qua a Palermo, presso il Dipartimento di Biologia Cellulare dello Sviluppo dell'Università di Palermo. E quello che cercherò di fare oggi è raccontarvi un poco uh, della mia esperienza qua a Palermo di ricerca, quindi l'argomento di cui noi ci occupiamo che è esattamente l'epigenetica. Siccome questo mio breve intervento di 10-15 minuti eh, dovrà andare online eh, su TED, eh, mi è stato chiesto di fare questo seminario in inglese, però eh, diciamo, eh, dato che adesso non so se nell'audience tutti quanti eh, eh, magari eh, riusciamo a parlare l'inglese, cercherò di sintetizzare veramente in due parole eh, l'argomento del, del mio intervento. Parlerò di epigenetica come frontiera uh, dello studio della terapia genica e cercherò di fare una, una, un piccolo intervento divulgativo, un piccolo messaggio divulgativo dell'importanza che sta avendo l'epigenetica uh, nella medicina molecolare moderna, perché ritengo sia il futuro ovviamente di uh, tantissime potenziali applicazioni al campo biomedico. Uh, inizio quindi il mio intervento, quindi da questo momento in poi parlerò uh, in inglese. Um, so this is the, the first slide of my talk and uh, I will be talking about epigenetics uh, which is the multidimensional nature of our genome and uh, I'll start with the first slide showing the fam famous Vitruvian um, uh, man from Leonardo and, and basically this shows us that our body is made of uh, several organs and each of those organs is made up of cells and cells are the basic unit of each of our organs, shown here on the right-hand side of this slide, these pinkish uh, uh, red dots. Um, what is special about cells is that they have a tiny little dot, which is shown here in blue, uh, which is called nucleus. And inside the nucleus of each cell, uh, it stored our genomic and genetic information in forms of chromosomes. And those tiny little sticks are called chromosomes. And, uh, If we expand our view inside chromosomes, if we try to magnify what's inside chromosomes, we will see chromatin fibers. And those uh, uh, little fibers are inside chromosomes. And again, if we would have a, a super giant magnifying lens to go inside those chromatin fibers, we would see what we call the basic unit of our genome, which is called the nucleosome. But what is a nucleosome? The nucleosome, it's like a spool, a spool of our grandmother where they, they, they tied up you know, their threads. And this spool is made up of proteins, which are molecules present in our cells. Um, these molecules organize themselves into what we call tetramers and dimers, and they form an octamers, which is like a ball. Okay? And around this little ball, this little spool, the DNA, which is another molecule, wraps around twice. Okay? to form those uh, threads around the spools. And these spools, called nucleosomes, are repeated about uh, thousands and thousands of times in our genome. And uh, arrays of nucleosomes organize into chromosomes. One problem that our cells have is to access DNA. So how can, in each cell, a uh, process extremely complicated like uh, the activation of a gene or the replication of DNA can function is due to the fact that there are some regions of chromatin that are closed because they are inaccessible to factors and some other regions that are instead open. So those beads on a string structure is basically more open or closed. And uh, this is a problem for the cell because even on open chromatin, um, There are processes like transcription, which is the activation of gene, or for example, when a cell has to duplicate and has to replicate its DNA and has to access DNA, or for example, when the cell gets damaged by environmental uh, insults, it has to repair DNA, or for example, when two chromosomes have to recombine, and recombination is an important event because uh, we wouldn't be so much different between us if there wouldn't be recombination in our gametes, our sex cells. And so there is a problem. Uh, there are proteins that need to bind DNA in certain regions, and in order to do so, they need special 
um, activities present into the cell in order for them to get access to DNA. And DNA is like a big library. Try to imagine a library with many books. And uh, those books must be, of course, cataloged. So you need a, a catalog of each book in the library. And of course, you also need a librarian that does his job by putting each book you know, in, 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 in the correct shelf. And even when you take a book, if you do not bookmark a specific page, you probably will forget you know, where you left your book and you know, how the story goes. So DNA is very much like a book or like you know, uh, books on a library. And the cells of our body have evolved mechanisms very similar to what we normally see in a library. So the DNA is tagged pretty much like, uh, like post-it. You know, we use post-it to remember you know, what we do and why we do it and, and when we have to do it. And the DNA is also tagged with post-it. But instead of adding real post-it, there are special chemical tags that are added at the nucleosomal site, those spools. And at the end, our DNA is decorated with many post-its, those uh, orange, yellow, and blue spots that you see there. And those are chemicals. Uh, we name it methylation, acetylation, and you, you know, so forth and so on. Uh, what is important is not the chemical nature of those tags, but the fact that the DNA is not equal in all of our cells, but each cell has the same DNA, but different tags. So at the end, uh, we also have all other machines that use the energy of the cell to slide those spools or to remove some of those spools or to exchange those spools or to protrude the DNA from those spools. And all together, these activities uh, make up not our genome, because our genome is identical in every, in every cell that are present in our body. But every cell of our body is different just because we have many epigenomes. So one genome for every human being but many epigenomes for the different cell types that are present in our body. The eye cell has the same, epigen the same genome of our liver cell, but they have two different epigenomes. So uh, we have to imagine that the epigenome, it's like an origami paper. So the origami paper usually is like a, a piece of square uh, uh, paper. And uh, usually that you know, doesn't have any shape, but depends on how you fold it. You may create like a frog or a, um, um, a bird or you know, a, a boat or whatever you want. And the piece of paper is the genome. And the way you fold this piece of paper is the epigenome. So each cell acquire a different fold and become specialized in doing special tasks. Um, so our old view of genetics is that if you have a lesion on the DNA, then you have a genetic defect. And we have come to the conclusion that uh, the epigenome, when it's altered, it also causes a specific defect. So even without specific DNA lesions, alterations of the epigenome may cause diseases and may have an impact on our life. So in this case, our librarian is confused because he doesn't know where to put books and in, in our example. Uh, what are the source of epigenetics alteration? So for example, the environment. The environment, it's a source of potential epigenetic uh, alterations. Or our diet, what we eat will change the way our epigenome uh, 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 is shaped in our cells. Uh, and another source of epigenetic alterations comes from lifestyle. Depending on the lifestyle we have, we may have different epigenetic alterations. And I will give you just three examples of how much in the last decade, epigenetics has impacted you know, so many fields uh, in science. For example, in nutrition and diets, it is known that uh, a mother, depending what she eats, will uh, affect the, uh, either the lifespan or the likelihood that its child or her child will have, for example, diabetes. It has been shown that there are specific epigenetic modification occurring in the pregnant mother, depending on the food she eats, that will be inherited epigenetically into the child. Uh, another example is, for example, the behavior. We all know that twins are genomically identical. They have exactly the same genome. But why two twins are so different? 
And if you take one twin in one, on one side of the country and you take another one uh, that live you know, under different conditions, they will grow up as two different individuals. And this is due to the epigenetic modification that they will acquire. And just a final example, our life is set by clocks. We know we wake up a certain time of the days, we know we go to sleep a certain time of the days. If we mess up with this clock, we just scramble our life and you know we have to sleep, we have to be awake for a certain amount of time. And this clock is not just you know, uh, something that we cannot catch. Scientists have shown that this clock has a molecular basis, has a biochemical basis, and it's epigenetics. And of course, there are many human diseases that are caused by epigenetic uh, uh, alterations. So the impact of those studies are extremely high for human being. So, and I will just finish my talk showing that the potential of the epigenetic therapy, it's clear from recent studies on stem cells showing that basically stem cells have a specific epigenetic program and they can be by small drugs reprogrammed to, for example, produce pancreas cells or blood cells, heart cells, uh, bone cells or fat cells. And this, of course, has a high impact in what we call regenerative medicine because we may think of uh, taking one cell from one human being and then reprogram it epigenetically and then make a tissue. And this, of course, you know, will have a high impact in medical sciences. And that's what we do here in Palermo, in, in, in my lab. And, uh, of course, uh, I would like to thank all the people in my lab that have contributed to this uh, great dream to do science and epigenetics in Palermo. And I would like to thank all of you for your attention and Ted for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Thanks a lot.